الله بالخير في كتابه المرتد من المسيحية إلى الإسلام في زمن العولمة والإرهاب يصف يوران فان كلافرن السياسي الهولندي رحلته الشخصية واللاهوتية والتطور الذي مر به والتحديات قبل اعتناقه الإسلام في زمن بات فيه الاستخدام السياسي للدين في الشؤون المحلية والدولية عاملا مهما في التنافس على السلطة ولتعزيز مختلف المشاريع التوسعية وللتأثير المباشر في تطور النزاعات الحالية حول العالم فما الذي دفع هذا السياسي اليميني المتطرف إلى اعتناق الإسلام؟ كيف تتشكل الآراء المعادية للإسلام في الغرب؟ هل يدعو الإسلام حقا إلى العنف وكراهية غير المسلمين واضطهاد النساء؟ ما دور وسائل الإعلام في نشر المعلومات المضللة والعنصرية ضد الإسلام؟ وكيف تواجه الأمة التعديات الوقحة والمستمرة والممنهجة على الرموز المقدسة الإسلامية؟ وماذا عن ازدواجية المعايير؟ نرحب بكم ونرى ونسمع أكثر عن الطبيعة المعقدة للإسلاموفوبيا ودينامياتها المزعزعة للاستقرار في الغرب مع السياسي الهولندي السابق يوران فان كلافرن في البعد الأقرب هذه الميادين وأنا زينب صفار خليكم ويانا Jeroen van Kleffren, Dutch former far-right politician who converted to Islam, former member of parliament for the far-right party for freedom, PVV, co-founder of the Islam Experience Center, author of Apostate from Christianity to Islam in times of secularization and terror. Mr. Yuran Van Klaffren, Assalamu alaikum and welcome to Al Mayadeen. This is the proximate aspect. I'm Zainab Al Safar. Pure pleasure to have you, sir. Assalamu yeah, alaikum, salam. It's a great honor for me to be here. Always a pleasure. Well, um, it takes immense audacity and courage to make a 180 degree shift publicly, Yuran. Yuran, uh, uh, you are uh, the crown. Prince of Wilders, as Dutch media liked to call you uh, back then. For seven years in the lower house of the Netherlands, you preached hardline anti-Islam politics on behalf of the Party for Freedom, uh, reading through your past speeches and proposed laws, uh, calling for the closing of mosques, for the removing of the Quran from parliament, for banning Islam from the country from the Netherlands, one can sense a ferocity of criticism and hatred, so to say, of Islam that surpassed even the cruelest of politicians. Yet, the one thing that made you join the far right, as you say, is the same thing that made you leave it in 2018. It was Islam. You fell in love with Islam, uh, as you quoted. How come? What instigated that transformation, Yoram? Yeah, well, uh, perhaps it's a little uh, uh, handy if I uh, give a little context. 
Uh, I was uh, born and raised in Amsterdam in, uh, let's say, the end 70s, beginning of the 80s, in a very Protestant uh, tradition. Mm -hmm. And the denomination I was brought up in was very anti-Islam in a historical way. When you look at the scholars, the big names like Martin Luther or um, Swingley or Kelvin, those people were very anti-Islam because of the political context back then with the Ottoman Empire. So mm -hmm. they legit their political position by their theology mm -hmm. so they said islam is evil etc my parents didn't taught us to hate muslims and even the preachers didn't say that but they said well it is a false religion so don't get too close to the to that religion mm -hmm. and uh, then um of course i went to college after uh secondary school i went to free university and i studied comparative religion mm -hmm. and the first day that I went to college was September 11, 2001. So the day of the attack on the World Trade Center in New York. So I already had this bias of anti-Islam feelings. And then I saw this terrorist attack happening. And so I thought, well, th these people are even crazier than I thought. And then in 2004, there was this famous filmmaker in the Netherlands. His name was Theo van Gogh. Mm -hmm. And he was in the street by a guy who called himself a jihadi. Mm -hmm. So I thought, it, this is the last straw. This is, this is it. I have to do something to protect the country against this evil ideology and all these crazy Muslims. So what is better to do than join a political party? Because if I can change the law, I have a big impact on the future of the country because I can change a lot of things. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that's how I ended up with, uh, with the Freedom Party of Geert Wilders. Right. Uh, so, Yoram, you were setting out to write a book uh, that was aimed to be, in a sense, a brutal attack on Islam itself. Yet in your book, uh, which is our reference apostate, you discussed various charges that had been used to discredit Islam, including anti-Semitism, violence and also uh, oppression of women. Uh, in the midst of such a chaos of information, misinformation and racism how could you find the truth yeah well in, in 2014 i got into a fight with geert wilders with the political leader of the of the party of the far and, right yes yeah and it was because of there was a a, a rally uh and there was election time and there was this rally in, a, in one of the big cities in the netherlands and he asked the people do you want more or less moroccan people in the netherlands and everybody mm -hmm. starts less 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 and he says well i'll make that happen for you if you vote for me but i was the spokesperson in parliament on this subject on this topic and i asked him because he didn't told me that he was about to say that so i asked him what is this because i don't hear the word islam and of course i was uh, i was very anti-islam but i wasn't per se anti-moroccan or anti-belgium or whatever it was not an ethnic thing to me it was really a religious thing. I hated Islam. But then I told him, well, you have to add something to the story because I, I'm not going to uh, uh, share this idea of getting rid of all Moroccan people just because they're Moroccan. And he said, well, I won't change it. And then we got into this fight. I said, well, if you don't change it, I'll leave. Mm -hmm. And he said, well, I don't think you'll leave, but I did. And then, of course, I had, and it sounds a little bit crazy, I had finally had the time to fulfill a long-held desire, and it was 2014, to write an anti-Islam book. Mm -hmm. And why I write an anti-Islam book because I wanted to explain in an academic, theological way why we, as the West, uh, of course, in my interpretation, the West and Christianity were right and the Muslims were wrong. But while I was writing the first chapter of the book about the concept of God, who is God, uh, then some doubts that I had as a child, as a, as a youngster, popped up again. For example, about the Trinity mm -hmm. and about the atonement and about the crucifixion of Christ as, as, as something that had to happen before God could forgive sins and also original sin. And I thought to myself, oh yeah, those questions I was struggling with. But of course, I was writing this anti-Islam book. So at first I had to explain why this was the right position, but I couldn't. So the doubts as a child popped up again. And then I started writing all these several authorities on Christianity, on Judaism, and also on Islam. And in the end... Um, I got, uh, yeah, so to say, Islamic answers to my Christian questions because one of the mm -hmm. persons I wrote to was Abdul Hakim Murad. He's mm -hmm. a Cambridge University. And I wrote him this, this, this email and I thought, well, he 
perhaps will never answer me because, of course, when you uh, look me up in Wikipedia, you see he's an anti, back then, of course, he is an anti-Islam politician from the Netherlands, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So I thought, well, he probably won't answer. Mm -hmm. And it took weeks, and after six weeks, I got a very extensive answer of him. And he started explaining, I, I see where you're coming from, but it's not the correct position. You're wrong about this, about this. And, and I asked him again in an email, what is it? Where am I wrong? And he starts explaining, well, most of the sources that you read, although they're academic sources, they're written by non-Muslims from mm -hmm. a very long time ago. But um, when I wrote him and I, he told me, you, now you'll see that uh, some of the things that the well, back then, centuries ago, uh, uh, people like Martin Luther and stuff, what they wrote about Islam was written from a political standpoint, but also add sometimes information that wasn't in the original sources. They left things out that were in the original sources, and mm -hmm. not always, mm -hmm. but it made uh, uh, it it uh, ended up being uh, mis misinformation. Mm -hmm. And then I start and I start reading the New Testament, so to say, part two of the Bible, the Bible of the Christians. And I thought, okay, I'll only read the parts where Jesus, Isa, uh, be some, peace and blessings be upon him, speaks. Mm -hmm. So there is this passage in the New Testament where this guy comes to Isa and he asks him, oh, good Lord, how can I gain paradise? Mm -hmm. And then Jesus answers him and he says, don't call me good. Only God is good. Mm -hmm. He says, there are two things you have to do. One, and he says, uh, he repeats the Shema, almost the Shahada of the Jews. He says, oh, hear, oh, Israel, children mm -hmm. of Israel, there's only one God, abide one God. Mm -hmm. And then he says, treat your neighbor as you want to be treated yourself. Mm -hmm. And then I thought to myself, this kind of is crazy. He First, he says, don't call me good. Only God is good. So there's a distinction between him and God when, when I'm reading his own words. Yes. And then he says, then the next part, he says, abide just one God. And then I thought, okay, perhaps there is some truth in this Tawhid concept is monotheism of the Muslims. So that's how I ended up, uh, yeah, really accepting the concept of Tawhid, of monotheism. Right. But uh, then, of, yeah, sorry. Yes, <laughs> sorry. Uh, obviously, uh, uh, Yoram, the manipulation of religious uh, factors to promote various political projects and schemes uh, represents an important challenge for the peaceful coexistence of communities within states and considerably affects the evolution of uh, current conflicts between states as well. Uh, Yoram, you never intended to be anything but an Islamophobe, as you just uh, explained. How did your Islamophobic opinions came to be formed? How your firmly established Islamophobia crumbled in the face of scholarly evidence. There is no religious context for most of the people here, but I was uh, from from a Christian background, perhaps one of the last Christian uh, communities in the in the Netherlands. Uh, so that but it did really form my opinion. And then, of course, the terrorist attacks that happened. But there's also the cultural aspect, because like I told you in the beginning, there have been centuries and centuries of um, of war with, for example, the Ottoman Empire. Mm -hmm. So, a lot of people, especially when you go to Eastern Europe, they are afraid of the Ottoman Empire because they say, well, it's an imperialistic power. They took our countries, they fought with us, etc. Et and there are Muslims. So, Muslims are scary, Muslims are angry, etc. Um, but of course, when you look at the whole historical context, it's a little bit different than that. But that's right. that's that's the cultural context that you are uh, brought up in, and that's that's very deep. In, uh, in European culture, because the historical enemy was Islam, so to say. Yes, allow me to, just to put it differently. Why is Islamophobia now more prominent within Dutch and Western societies? Is it because of the change in demographics? Uh, what is the impact of hateful political discourse on discrimination against uh, Muslims? And what is the role of Western media in promoting misinformation and fueling racism, Iran? Yeah, uh, well, 
the fact that there is a lot of immigration nowadays, that, that certainly is one of the aspects because a lot of people here think, well, who are these people? They look different, they eat different, et cetera, et cetera. So that's almost a, like a sociological truth. If someone doesn't look like you, you are, the first thing you do is uh, doubt them, you're scared, et cetera, et cetera. But of course, th those people uh, who live here, the Moroccan and Turkish people uh, mainly, uh, they're not new anymore. They're, most of them here, the, the communities are here over 70 years already. So that's it's it's kind of crazy that that's still here. But also, like I said, it's the historical context. It's very deep in European culture. When you add up the terrorist attacks and you have uh, the media that is very secular, extremely secular. Look at France, where, for example, they will uh, forbid the, uh, the, the dress of that a lot of Muslim uh, women wear. Headscarf is not allowed anymore in a lot of European countries. So the whole concept of secularization, that people don't know religion anymore. So people who are still religious, whether they are Christian, but especially Muslims, because most of the time they look different as well, they are seen as the other with a capital A, and they are seen almost as the enemy because we have other values. So they say, well, you do not want to accept our way of uh, life, uh, although most of the of, <laughs> of the, the 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 ethics used to be uh, um, the same ethics that we had here in the West, but mm -hmm. because they changed, because they left their religion, now all of the sudden people with a religious background, especially Muslims, are seen as scary. So the combination of all these factors makes it for uh, right wing organizations, the far right, very easy to gain votes. Because they say, look at them, they are doing this. And for mm -hmm. example, when we look at the, the, the Quran burnings, that's like a political threat. Because most of those people, they know that Muslims will get angry. It, they get right. emotional. In this so, sense, yes. Yes, uh, Iran, painful, hurtful, insulting, heinous, abominable, and more. These are just some words we can say about the recent incidents, of course, of the desecration of the Holy Quran in some countries, such as Sweden, Denmark, and the Netherlands. Under the guise of so-called freedom of expression, everything seems to be allowed in some European countries these days. Uh, a pathetic, one-sided interpretation of freedom of expression uh, appears to have been declared sacrosanct. Uh, it's double standards, right? It's extremely double standard. And it's also like the Western governments, they act like they cannot do anything, but that's not true. Mm -hmm. uh, people don't know that in uh, a few years ago, there was this uh, case in Austria. It was an Austrian politician, ES, and mm -hmm. uh, she said some things about the prophet, peace and blessings be upon him, were very uh, insulting. And then there was this judge, she said, you cannot say that. It's it's insulting to this uh, group of people. It's insulting in general to say stuff like that. So she got fined. But then she said, no, I'll take it to the European court. But the European court said the same. She said, you cannot say that. And she got fined again. So there is a jurisdiction that says that you cannot incite hatred, that you cannot do the things that people like burning the Quran do. So right. it, you, can, you only have to apply the same a European law, and it's European law, so it, it's the same in Europe, in, in, in the Netherlands, in Austria, in Denmark, in Sweden. So they just have to apply this case of ES versus Austria, and then the problem is over. But they don't want to. Right, but it's very ironic. I mean, uh, insulting the king can lead to four months in prison in the Netherlands, and until uh, 2014, blasphemy was also a criminal offense. Uh, singular insult, group insult, libel, slander, and sedition are all punishable offenses. Meanwhile, the burning and tearing up the desecration of the Quran. Uh, insulting more than 2 billion Muslims globally is taking place under police escort. What does that mean? Yeah, that is double standard <laughs> in practice, uh, unfortunately, because it doesn't make any sense. You cannot... Uh, I mean, insult... they don't respect even their own citizens in these countries? Yeah, they don't even respect their own law. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's really... Mm -hmm. it doesn't make any sense. But again, it's, it's, it's more a cultural thing. Yes, it really, and that is that is the, the, oh, the biggest problem. You look at the television, for example, movies in the West, in, in Hollywood. Most of the time, when you see an Arab or you see a, a Muslim, he's a terrorist or he is the enemy who is scary. So you're you're all almost brainwashed in a way. So that that's a big problem. True. Now, nowadays, in terms of the cultural war in the West, uh, there are schools in the Netherlands that annually 
uh, on what they call Purple Friday. They pay attention to eccentric anomalies like LGBTQ issues, but at the same time explicitly state that they do not want a prayer room for Muslim students who request it. Can Western liberalism tolerate anything at all but itself? No, and that's what we call the liberal paradox. Mm -hmm. uh, because if you say you, that liberalism only accepts what is uh, good in the eyes of the liberals, then the only thing that will uh, be tolerated is liberalism. But of course, that's against the whole concept of liberalism, being open and tolerant to people who have a different set of views, a different uh, opinion. Uh, so it's, it's, it's double standard. Uh, it's almost university double standard here. It's very sad to see. Sure. Now, uh, these are heady times for Europe's far right. Illegal uh, immigration, of course, is spiking. Uh, the economy is anemic. The repercussions of the Ukraine war, of course, uh, those developments have vaulted the parties to new heights and in some countries into government, also uh, fueling fears in uh, some quarters of a rightward shift in Europe's political landscape, this kind of inclination more towards the far right. Uh, the perception that migrants pose the biggest threat to public security is fueled by almost daily reports of horrific crimes, uh, and you mentioned that, in which foreigners are the primary suspects or so is promoted. Are we witnessing the springtime for Europe's fascist Yoram? Well, it depends a little bit on uh, the country, because when you look at, for example, Sweden, the fact that they don't want, for example, a uh, ban these Quran burnings has to do with the fact that they have like what they call a minority government at the moment. So there's there are two uh, right wing organizations. They are in charge, but they didn't get enough votes. So they have they depend on the support of the far right, the SD, Sweden Democrats and the Sweden Democrats are very anti Islam. So when the government says, OK, we're going to ban these Quran burnings and we're going to appease, so to say, then uh, these guys of the far right will say, do whatever you want, but you cannot count on me anymore. And then government will fall. So they're very heavily depending on organizations like that. And the same in, in Italy, when you look at Maloney, mm -hmm. she, she used to have, I don't know how she is now, but she used to have very anti uh, Islam uh, political standpoints, and the same goes for Denmark, and the same goes for some parties in, in uh, Austria and in uh, Germany, in Belgium, in the Netherlands. Mm -hmm. So it's a big problem. And uh, yeah, it depends on the country, because there are also countries where, uh, where, where they pretty much do uh, the right thing, or at least they try to do the right thing. Uh, sure. How to address Islamophobia today and to what extent does interreligious and interfaith dialogue help in dismantling certain walls of ignorance? Share Islam. Mm -hmm. Show mm -hmm. people Islam. Let show yeah. them what the Sunnah is. Show them the correct uh, example and that that's one, one side and of course when it comes to all these uh, attacks on islam on the muslim communities uh, at least we still have courts <laughs> so you can take people to court mm -hmm. uh, and, that's the thing. And, and the third thing is that we have to establish institutions that can fight uh, these developments on a political stage but also when it comes to lobbying in more like uh, social uh, uh, organizations mm -hmm. Uh, Yoram van Klaveren, former far-right politician. Thank you very much, Yoram, for your insights. Have a glorious day, sir, and always a pleasure to have you. Likewise. Thank you very much. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum as -salam. وبينما كان يورام فان كلافرن يتبحر في أبحاثه عن الإسلام والتمحيص والغوص فيه أذهل وأدهش بما وجده وأدرك أن اعتراضاته على الإسلام ليس لها أي مبرر على الإطلاق يورام لمس أن أسس الإسلاموفوبيا ذاتها لم تكن أكثر من كذبة فارغة وفي تحول مذهل أثناء تأليف كتابه اعتنق الإسلام اليوم يرى المراقبون في الغرب أن هناك تحولا في كيفية مقاربة الإسلام داخل القوى الغربية وإن كان تحولا دقيقا وتدريجيا وهذا يعني أن الإسلام الذي كان في السابق ينظر إليه على أنه دين 
قمعي وسلطوي ومعاد للغرب بشدة يتطور اليوم ليصبح نظاما عقائديا قادرا على العمل كحارس للقيم التقليدية لأوروبا بحسب الخبراء وعلى النقيض من المسيحية فإن الإسلام في هذا التفسير الجديد يمتلك الحيوية التي تمكنه من معارضة النزعات العلمانية ولكن يبقى الحوار الشفاف والبناء بين الأديان والمذاهب هو المحدد والمحفز الفعلي لمستقبل العلاقات الدبلوماسية الناجحة بين الشعوب نختم بقوله تعالى بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يؤتي الحكمة من يشاء ومن يؤتى الحكمة فقد أوتي خيرا كثيرا وما يذكر إلا أولو الألباب صدق الله العلي العظيم من كل الميادين سلاما وتحية في مالا